what I'm going to do is I'm going to take myself off video uh, so you don't need to just see my little talking head in the corner. It's far more important that you are able to see the content of the slides. Um, and just a little bit, I'll do that now. Okie doke. Now, um, just a little bit of uh, sort of housekeeping and um, tech type issues. Uh, so that this hopefully runs smoothly. Uh, this may well be the first time you've used Microsoft Teams for a webinar. It is for us too. So we've been trying to find the platform that's the most accessible to the most people. Um, so we would really love your feedback about your experience in using Teams and whether you think this is uh, accessible to you, useful for you, and then we will, if if it's sort of generally positive, then we'll continue to use this for the subsequent webinars that we have in our series. Uh, for your information, the uh, webinar will be recorded and I believe it's going to be available for 30 days for people who have registered so that you can refer back to it um, or, uh, you know, if you have to step out early then you can come back and view the bit that you missed or you may have colleagues that have registered that just couldn't make it onto the webinar today. Um, and just a little heads up, I will mention this again at the end, but our next session is on the lymph crop vest, which is a garment that was designed specifically for lymphedema or, uh, and edema of the breast and the chest wall. So if that's uh, interesting to you, then please join us for that. But otherwise, the one after that is a universally valuable webinar because it's on garment prescription and design. Uh, just a couple of practical things. Um, we uh, we're going to have a question and answer um, session at the end, uh, but if you have a burning question that you need to clarify, just unmute yourself and ask that question. But obviously for the remainder of the webinar, if you could mute, it will just make it easier for everybody to hear. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will just mean that things can uh, move uh, relatively smoothly. Uh, so we'll get started. Hopefully that's given people uh, two or three minutes to get on who were running late. But can I just uh, start proper by saying uh, thank you for being here and welcome. We hope this is uh, really useful uh, to you and supports your clinical practice. If you're an experienced therapist, some of this information will be old news, but we really hope that there is sufficient in the content to make it content to make it valuable to you. Um, and also a lot of reviewing familiar information, I'm sure you'd agree with me, is really helpful. It's kind of a good reminder anyway, but also it's helpful when you are mentoring younger therapists or when you have students. OK, so what we're going to be covering today, oh, I'm just having a bit of problem advancing the slide. Here we go. Um, we're just going to review a bit about the prescription guidelines based on the construction of a garment. Uh, those of you who work in <coughs> with lymphedema will be very familiar with this. Those of you who work in plastics or burns or a couple of those other clinical areas, this some of this might be quite new information to you. We'll briefly cover the precautions and contraindications for using compression. We're going to talk about the principles of graduated compression in the upper limb. And then we're going to give you a little bit of a sneaky peek into um, how garments, the graduated compression is calculated. So if you're a compression nerd like me, you will uh, just love that. Um, otherwise, it's it's useful information to have an understanding of. We'll, uh, give a bit of an overview of the measuring system. And then from a really practical point of view, we're going to go through the options and the modifications that are available for the upper limb so that when you look at the forms, you have a sense of exactly what it is that you need to order. And then we'll briefly uh, go over how you prescribe and order a garment. So some of you would be very familiar with job skin. Some of you maybe not so much. So why would you choose job skin when you're looking at upper limb garments? I suppose the first uh, real asset that Job Skin brings to the table is the fact that it is fully customizable. It maybe I'm slightly overstating it, but really 
pretty much anything that you can dream up, um, our design team are able to fabricate for um, an upper limb, uh, obviously with consulting with you. Uh, the other thing is that you can select the level of compression that you want. For example, if you were using a ready to wear arm sleeve, you can generally buy them at uh, 30 millimetres of mercury, maybe 40 millimetres of mercury. Um, but with a Job skin garment, you can vary it anything from 20 millimetres and up, and you can actually vary it within a garment. Uh, any size uh, in a custom garment like Job skin can be accommodated, whether it's from tiny bubs to uh, adults, uh, from the thin to the super morbidly obese. And, uh, you know, that latter category brings its own challenges and we will be looking at some of those in later webinars. You can make accommodations and adjustments for uh, issues with skin in integrity or comfort. And you can modify a garment to uh, make it easier to get on and off. Um, uh, like the obvious one is zips. Zips don't always make it easier, but they can be included in a garment. And finally, uh, the real plus with a Job skin garment is that the aesthetics can be manipulated so that it's something that your patient is happy to wear. So what sort of clinical indications are suitable for a Job skin garment? The list is extensive actually. Scarring and burns, mild to moderate edema, traumatic edema, for palliative care it can be very useful, mild to moderate lymphedema, dependent edema, uh, and a range of uh, vascular issues. Obviously these come into play more with the lower limbs than the upper limbs. And just a comment with edema and lymphedema, the reason I say in their mild to moderate is that um, those of you who work in this kind of clinical area will fully understand that uh, advanced edema or severe edema, advanced lymphedema brings its own challenges with shaping of a garment and that there's risk of tourniquets with a soft fabric that will sort of fall into folds. So that's why that's limited there. So just a little bit about compression garment construction. Uh, I know that you're all aware that there's a range of different kinds of garments, um, but they can be loosely grouped into three categories. The first is circular knit, which is the majority of ready to wear garments are circular knit garments, the sort of uh, the uh, an arm sleeve that can be purchased from a chemist or a baloney sock that can be purchased from a chemist is a circular knit garment. And the reason there's a little image of a French knitting spool, those of you who uh, dabbled in this or saw uh, kids in the playground doing this at primary school, um, the, basically a circular knit garment is just a ginormous French knitted garment where it's a single piece of thread that is uh, knitted in circular motion and uh, if you ever did French knitting at school, you'll remember if the tension was really tight, you got a skinny tube. If the tension was really loose, you got a bigger tube. And that very uh, sort of dumbing it down to its nth degree, that is the way a circular knit garment is made. What's important to know about that is that if you were to cut that garment, it would curl. And that's part of the characteristic of circular knitting. And the problem with that is that it then has a risk of tourniquet. So, and that clearly with a circular knit garment too, it's ready to wear. So there's sort of basic sizing. And what over the years, what I've said many, many times is if someone doesn't fit a ready to wear garment, they don't fit. Because if you try to force them um, into a garment that are a bit loose at the ankle and a bit tight at the calf uh, or a bit you know loose at the wrist and tight at the upper arm you are actually um, throwing graduated compression out the window. All right so the second category is a flat knit garment and these are most common commonly used uh, in the edema or lymphedema realm and it's a knitted fabric uh, which is a kind of a heavyweight fabric. Some of you would be very familiar with them. Some of you may never have seen a flat knit garment. Um, 
they're custom knitted in one piece and they generally have a single seam down the back of the arm or down the back of the leg. Um, and they are very stiff. They have what's called a high stiffness index. And so the garment holds its shape. So that's quite helpful for riding over creases in tissue. Um, it's a fairly open weave, but it is a thick knit, knit uh, and generally fairly unpalatable to um, patients who don't require the clinical specs of a flat knit garment. They are used in Europe um, for um, scar management uh, and for burns management, but that's generally because of their colder climate. They still use cut and sew, but I think the flat knit garment manufacturing companies do sort of try and actively move into the scar management realm. Um, then the third category is what we call a cut and sew garment. This is where Job skin sits. So just like the shirt that you're wearing at the moment has been cut out of pieces of fabric, most likely, um, so is a um, good pun there. So is a Job skin garment. Um, so uh, the measurements are taken, accurate body measurements are taken, and then the designer cuts a pattern so that it will fit a body uh, a body measure. It's a softer fabric than a flat knit, but it doesn't curl. So it doesn't have that stiffness, but it doesn't have that curling risk that a circular knit carries. Um, there are, it's very, as we've mentioned in why choose a job skin, there are lots of options that are available in the cut and sew garment. It's very modifiable in a way that circular knit and flat knit clearly are not. So really, when you consider some of the ways that those garments are constructed, you can see that actually the type of garment that you select, so what you actually prescribed, has to take into account how a garment um, what a garment's able to do um, and uh, takes into account its construction and therefore informs what it's able to do. So hopefully that's a helpful overview um, for you and we're going to move straight on from that. But if you do have any questions, please jot them down and we can look at that in the Q&A uh, session. So why custom made? Because the almost exclusively um, the garments that Job Skin supplies are custom made. Um, so what I would say is that custom made is essential or um, certainly beneficial but often essential when um, these sort of situations are the case. Firstly, and this is an essential one, if a patient doesn't fit a ready to wear, which might be because their circumferences are too large or maybe too small, um, that's certainly the case for children because ready to wear garments are not available for in the pediatric population. Uh, if people are particularly tall or particularly short, uh, then they don't fit a ready to wear. Sometimes it's just limb length uh, and also proportion where it might be very narrow and uh, wrists and very wide upper arms, then it's not suitable. And, and like I say, it's not like, um, trying to fit into a pair of jeans where you've, uh, you're have sort of slightly more generously hipped so that you would say, oh, you're a 14 at your hips and 10 at your waist, so you'll go for a size 12. We just can't work like that because of the principles of graduated compression. It's essential when, uh, or it's beneficial when a flat knit isn't clinically indicated. So you need some something custom made. So that takes you out of the ready to wear uh, realm. So you can then choose, do you go for cut and sew or flat knit? If flat knit's clinically indicated, that's what you've got to do. But when it's not, you have lots of options with a cut and sew job skin garment. If your patient's an odd shape, that might be proportion uh, or um, un un amputations, uh, congenital mal uh, deformities, those sorts of things. Uh, and when you need a really accurate fit, uh, sometimes uh, a ready to wear will suffice, but sometimes it's just not going to provide you with uh, an accurate enough fit. De uh, defects, surgical defects, trauma is a very good example of that. Maybe when you need higher levels of compression uh, or when a suitable style is not available, because the reality is ready to wear basically comes for um, 
an upper limb comes in an arm sleeve uh, or a glove uh, may, and a gauntlet. If you need something that, uh, say, needs to go over the shoulder, that's not possible as a ready-to-wear garment. Um, and when you just need to incorporate design options or whether you need to modify the garment. So very quickly, the precautions and contraindications, I'm sure this is something you're all familiar with, um, but it's important that we assess a patient for comorbidities. Uh, now, these, some of these apply to the lower limb, but these are the precautions and contraindications that we would consider overall. Um, the arterial insufficiency only applies for lower limb garments. But when somebody has cardiac uh, issues or renal uh, uh, renal condition, we need to be sure that they are cleared, medically cleared for compression because as we compress distally, we increase the central uh, fluid load. If there's extreme shape distortions of a limb and deep skin folds, tread carefully, but uh, it might be that they're suitable for a flat knit garment. Certainly uh, any exudative wounds or lymphorrhea where there's uh, neuropathy or again from a safety point of view where there's uh, pulmonary edema and also when um, there's uh, the skin state um, means that you can compromise the integrity of the skin by putting on and off a garment. That's listed as a precaution rather than a contraindication because oftentimes a garment can be modified to accommodate that. Now let's talk a bit about um, graduated compression in the upper limb. And I, I suspect that some of this information will be quite new to uh, even some of you who are quite experienced because when you order a custom uh, Job skin garment and you request, say, 30 millimetres of mercury, uh, that's uh, calculated as a whole body concept. So that means uh, if I use a leg as an example, if you ordered a 30 millimetres of mercury um, uh, baloney sock, it would be applying 30 millimetres of mercury compression at the ankle. But by the time it gets to the calf, it's probably applying about 24% of compression. Um, so 24, not not percentage, sorry, uh, 24 millimetres of mercury because the compression is graduated. We want more compression distally than we do um, proximally because that supports fluid flow. With the upper limb, we don't, if you request 30 millimetres of mercury, it doesn't start at 30 millimetres of mercury uh, unless you specifically request that because it's based on whole body calculations. So routinely, a 30 millimetre of mercury uh, garment for the upper limb actually will start at around 20 millimetres of mercury because it is referenced to the lower limb. And this is something that's worth checking with our design, te design team who are all over that. So really what I'm saying is that the nominated compression is referenced to the ankle compression. Now, graduation can be manipulated based on your therapeutic aims. So we use a fairly routine reduction or a standard reduction where it's between 40 and 70 percent uh, at about a third of the way up the limb. And then it can be somewhere between 20 and 60 percent at the most proximal point of the limb. So that means if you have someone that you need to maintain compression uh, strongly at the upper limb because that's where most of the issue is, rather than having a reduction that goes from 100% to 60% to 20%, we could actually do 100 to 70 to 60 so that the degree of graduation is reduced. Um, and it's helpful for you to know that when you put the date of birth, which is required on a job skin form, the designers take that into account because levels of compression are adjusted based on age to ensure uh, safety of your patients so that they don't have excessive um, compression in the over 70 age group. So very quickly, a bit of an overview of the principles of compression. Um, 
When you look at an upper limb garment, in fact, it is just proximal to the wrist that it's 100% of the level that you nominated because we ease it off a bit right at the distal end of the garment for safety. And you can see that the, the reduction points along there, 100% just proximal to the wrist, 80% around the forearm, eased off a bit at the elbow uh, around the joint, 80% in the upper arm and then 50% of whatever that nominated compression is at the top of the garment. Uh, you may well have some questions about that, so please jot them down and we're, we'd be happy to address them in the Q&A. Um, so now this, uh, Anne-Marie, one of our, oh, our principal designer in the factory, very kindly forwarded me a sample uh, pattern and this just gives you a little bit of an idea. If you have a look at the levels of, uh, I hope you can see my cursor there, the levels of compression here, this is a light compression garment. So it's 12 millimetres of mercury at the distal end of the garment, which is 80% of 15 millimetres, which is what was nominated for this garment, uh, just uh, proximal to the wrist. And then you can see it's reasonably static, but then reduces around the elbow for safety. And then um, I can't actually see because I've got a little webinar thingo in there, but you can see how the every four centimetres measurements of a Job skin garment, the compression levels are calculated accordingly and um, there is some room for manipulation. So just as a little bit of a guideline, if a, uh, or a, an example probably, uh, if you have a look at an arm sleeve that's been requested at 30 millimetres of mercury, remember that's reference to the ankle, then you are having on the main therapeutic compression level is 15 millimetres of mercury. And you can see how that reduces from the wrist up to the most proximal tape. Um, and for those of you who work in the lymphedema space, you can see that uh, for somebody, oh, that shouldn't say 70 millimetres of mercury there. That's my mistake. I apologise. That should say for someone older than 70 years, uh, this would be the standard calculation. But if they are younger, you can see that there are higher levels that, um, but the calculations remain the same. I hope that's helpful to you and I, um, I hope that was sufficiently clear um, and we'll just move on. So a little bit about how to measure the upper limb. Some of you, uh, as I said earlier, will be very familiar with this because uh, you use Job skin routinely. Some of you, this may be new. So um, for an arm, you need the purple upper limb tape here. Uh, which we'll show you a little bit more about in a sec. And then the forms that you need depends on what you're ordering. It might be an arm sleeve form, a vest form, a bodysuit form, or if you're measuring a hand, you'll need the glove or gauntlet form. So that if you are measuring only for a hand, you need the hand and finger tape, which is a very simple way of measuring these smaller finger circumferences, particularly with children, um, and you'll be predominantly using the glove and gauntlet form. So I'm just going to start a video in a sec, which is going to demonstrate how an upper limb um, is measured using the Job Skin measuring system. To measure the upper limb, you need to use the Moss paper tape. Uh, this will be eventually replaced by a purple paper tape. Ideally, Position the patient in sitting with the arms straight and out to the side with the hand resting palm down on a surface. Position the tape on top along the length of the limb, taking care to ensure the distal and proximal markings are correctly orientated. Secure the solid coloured tape around the elbow. If the patient is able to assist, you may like to ask them to anchor the proximal end of the tape. Secure the remaining tapes around the limb. 
taking care to ensure the circumferential tapes cross the spine tape at right angles. It doesn't matter if you work towards the wrist or towards the axilla. Your aim is to get an accurate body measure, so the paper tape should be pulled slightly firmly, but not tight. The skin will just indent, and it is important that it is no more than that, or the garment will be too tight. It is helpful to add sticky tape to the secured measure to ensure no movement of the tapes. The coloured spine tape provides the length measurements as each circumferential tape is 3.8 centimetres apart. When you reach the wrist or axilla, you may need to adjust the length. If the final tape wraps the limb where you want the garment to end, no adjustment is necessary. However, if the final tape is beyond that point, the length is adjusted by pleating the spine. This pleat should be secured with sticky tape. When all the tapes have been secured, tear the circumferential tapes away from the straight edge of the spine to remove the measuring tape from the patient. If you're measuring for a vest with arm sleeves, before removing the tape, mark the height of the top tape using the Job Skin Body Marker Highlighter. Transfer the measurements and complete the form as explained in the introductory video. Okay, and we're going to watch a video in a sec, which is how to measure for the hand. Quick comment about that one is that the, what was called the Moss uh, paper tape is now, has now been replaced by the purple paper tape. Um, all right. Most of the measurements for the hand are taken with the hand measuring tape. Assemble the tape as shown. You will also need the Job Skin retractable tape measure and will need the glove or gauntlet form at the time of measuring. Start by tracing the hand onto the hand trace form taking care to ensure the height of the web spaces is accurate. The middle finger and the forearm should follow the black dotted line and the fingers should be slightly splayed. Two helpful hints. One, using the refill of a pen makes it easier to get an accurate trace as the bulk of the pen does not distort the line. And two, mark the height of the web spaces first before doing the trace. When you have traced around the hand, before the patient removes their hand from the form, mark the wrist and the length of the glove fingers if the garment is to be open tipped. Position yourself and the patient so that you can comfortably measure the hand and simultaneously report each measurement. Each finger has three measurements taken. The base of the finger, the PIP,
sorry about that. Uh, my um, my unmuting function didn't quite work. Um, just a couple of points of clarification about the um, measuring the hand video. If you find the uh, measuring on the hand trace all a bit intimidating, if it's fairly unfamiliar to you, you are welcome to just send the trace as it is with your order form and the design team will help you with that. As you become more proficient, you'll probably find that you choose to do that yourself because you feel like you've got complete control over the finger length. But just something to be aware of. I'm just trying to get the slide to advance. Here we go. Now we're going to spend a, a little while talking about some of the upper limb options and modifications. You, um, We have a uh, guide that's available you can print from the website or we're very happy to post it to you in a sort of a it's a, a printed on a heavier weight card so to keep in your clinic it's very useful but I've just this just shows the front and the back of the document where it outlines um, the majority of the uh, upper limb garment styles and options which we're going to walk you through now. But just for, actually, just before we get to that, I'm just going to show you how to read the tape measures. Again, if you've used Job Skin before, this is going to be familiar. Um, but if it's new, then it just takes uh, a little bit of getting used to. It's not not tricky at all. Just once you understand. So if you have a look at the um, this tape here, this is a as a tape would appear when you've just taken it off the arm. You can see the cut, or the can be cut or torn edges at the top of the garment. And where that pink line is where you are going to take your measurements. That, that's actually where you read the circumference. So just right moving in that direction. Uh, sometimes it's very easy to look at the solid colour of the main spine of the tape. See that number, it sort of seems to jump out at you and think you're reading, you're going to move up but it's important that you follow the direction of the arrow when you are reading the tape measure. So if you look at it close up, you can see that uh, um, the markings on the upper limb tape, those little fine lines are two millimetres apart. So you can see where that pink arrow is between 23 and 24, that's 23 centimetres and 24. And if you see that that arrow is pointing at to um, at the third line that would be what's actually the second line that's a four millimeters beyond 23. So when you are reading what we're reading there is the 25 number we're not referencing the 26, 25 three lines down so that measurement would be 25.6 meters. On a job skin form we don't use decimal points so that would just be 256 that you'd record on the form. This one would be 247. OK, so let's look a little bit more at the upper limb modifications. Uh, there's an overview there, but we're going to walk through each uh, group of them. So very simply, the garments that are available to you are an arm sleeve. You can either have wrist to axilla or wrist to elbow. Or you can have them with attachments for anchorage. You can have a bra loop. You can see on the left there where it uh, loops over a woman's bra strap. But can I just say, because it looks very good in theory, but it is not suitable for everybody. Because if they are very active, the risk is that in fact, the bra loop will pull the bra off the shoulder. So you need someone who has got quite a solid bra strap and probably if they are not um, overly active, otherwise it defeats the purpose. Or you can have a shoulder attachment. There's two styles shown here. One is the middle one is the female style where it goes between the breasts and anchors under the breast on the opposite side or the male version just goes straight across to the axilla. Um, one adjustment that can be made is that you can have an anterior uh, elbow insert here. Uh, and this uh, is 
often quite helpful for comfort because it um, helps to decrease uh, the bulk of fabric right in the cubital fossa there. Um, and of course, you can have a stump sleeve. It doesn't have to have the male chest attachment there. It's just shown that way. Um, and it is a very squared off end because we're looking at a, um, uh, a mannequin's arm. Now, for gloves, there are there's a range of different styles for gloves. But what I particularly wanted to highlight is the standard versus slant inserts. On the left, the purple glove has got uh, standard inserts. And to help you understand that, I've just got an illustration here where you can imagine on the purple glove, they have, because there is an outline of basically the front and the back of a hand that forms the shape of the glove, the, that, that's not sufficient to accommodate the circumference of a finger. So there are gussets that are stitched uh, into the finger and for a standard insert it's just a single strip of fabric like you can see on the top right in the purple which is then folded in half and stitched in but if you just have a look at your own hand now um, if you look at the palmer surface you will see the height of the web space at the base of the finger and then turn your hand over so you're looking at the back and you can see if you look uh, sort of specifically you can see that the web space on the back of your hand and I know you know this but it's when we stop and look specifically you think oh actually I can see how that would impact the fit of a glove but you can see that the web space on the dorsum of the hand is quite a bit lower. Now if uh, there's no specific issue with a uh, the web spaces Standard inserts are perfectly adequate. However, if you have uh, edema pockets in the base of the web spaces there, or if you have um, scarring that goes through that web space, that uh, you can see that the it needs good fit that's going to accommodate right into that web space. So if you have a look at the blue and green little illustration on the right, you can see that rather than a straight piece of fabric um, you that's folded in half, it's actually right angled. And when that's folded, if you look at the illustration on the very bottom right, that forms an angle. And so that's stitched into the garment so that you can see in that little uh, glove there with the monkey on it, there is this really um, snug fitting line where it actually, the web space, it dis descends with the web space. Can I just say though, when you are ordering, uh, choosing whether to order standard or slant inserts, if you've already got established hypertrophic scarring in the web space, um, and even more so if you've got the start of web creep where the height of the web spaces is um, increasing because of the tension, of the scarring, it's too late to put a slant insert in. All that's going to mean is that the the um, glove is going to sit a bit higher up the finger because no compression garment can possibly pull down against established hypertrophic scarring. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, um, that you might want to ask that question in our Q&A at the end. So uh, you can have a seam free thumb, which can be useful for comfort and our ready to wear gloves are made with seam free thumbs so that they can also be left and right purposed. Or an interdigital web spacer, which is another option if you're trying to get increased compression in the web space. Uh, you can have the palm reinforced uh, with uh, for particularly for durability very helpful in young children or people who uh, do slightly more manual work even though they would have the protection of gloves and you can have a, a palm grip which can be silicon dots or suede. The gauntlet is an alternative to a glove which is basically essentially it's a fingerless glove uh, and that's a fairly standard uh, garment or you can get a finger stall which is linked to a wristband because uh, every clinician knows that finger stalls don't always stay on fingers, but this is a way of uh, uh, anchoring it. 
So a couple of other options and modifications. You can attach an arm sleeve to a vest. On the left, there's a short sleeved, what we call Adonis garment. Uh, and this is particularly useful if you imagine that with one long sleeve, if you needed a long sleeve option, particularly useful for ch active children if they don't need compression on their uh, torso for therapeutic purposes. The fact that there's a gap on the um, chest walls there means that they can be jumping and running around, lifting arms up and down, and the vest is not sliding up and down because that little gap accommodates that. Also, it's a way of providing good therapeutic compression over the deltoid if you need compression there uh, without having to go into a full vest, and it's a little bit cooler. Obviously, uh, being used like that, it's suitable for men, not for women. Um, it can... Uh, a uh, arm sleeve can of course be incorporated into a vest as you can see in the middle there and those of you working in lymphedema uh, it means that you can do so too on the lymph crop vest which as I say is our next webinar. A couple of other things to be aware of if you are incorporating an arm sleeve into a vest is that there are a range of axilla styles. Uh, this is a standard axilla on the left there that's got soft lycra material in it. Same style uh, of construction uh, for an open axilla, but obviously without any fabric in the axilla, or it can be replaced with mesh. All of those three uh, are constructed as a standard axilla, but with different fillings, so to speak. On the right, though, is an Irish axilla, which you can see that say if we look at the pink, the light pink one for the soft axilla, you can see that it flattens out a bit across the axilla, which is good for comfort. Um, but for some, uh, there are some occasions where you really need that fit to come right up into the crease of the axilla. And the Irish axilla having two gussets with a seam in the middle is a way to achieve that. So it can be a little bit it's a little bit firmer in the axilla, so some people may find it less comfortable. But we, when you as a clinician are uh, looking at the therapeutic purpose, that might be an option that you select. Now, something else to uh, mention that some of you may well already be aware of that can be incorporated into upper limb garments is Cylon Tex fabric. Cylon Tex is half a millimetre thick and it is a silicon fabric. The very first time I saw Cylon Tex, I was very sceptical because I thought usually silicon gel sheets last a maximum of four to six weeks. Why would I sew something into a garment that, that I want to last in excess of three months? Well, Cylon Tex does last the distance and so it becomes a much more affordable uh, alternative actually to silicon gel sheets. It conforms well. It's suited to contact over small circum circumference, circumferences like fingers or toes, uh, which are very difficult to get silicon gel sheets into. And um, apologies for this popping up. Uh, and But the one thing I would say is don't ever put uh, more than 50% of a circumference of any uh, arm sleeve or finger into a... Uh, uh, garment because they become very difficult to uh, don and in fact sometimes it's worth considering adding in a zip just because it's a little bit the Cylon Tex is a little bit kind of grabby in the way that you don a garment. Uh, when we're talking about alternatives for uh, the upper limb for compression it's important that you uh, are aware of the Job Skin ready to wear gloves. As I said before, it's a thumb free construction. You, uh, it's a soft power net, so it's comfortable and it's easy to don. You can use it as an interim garment. Uh, it's suitable for managing edema or for scarring. It's a cost effective alternative to custom garments if the sizing is suitable for your patient and it's got a very easy measuring system. We basically take a circumference of the wrist and of the palm and it's small, medium, large or extra large. Now, just to finish up, we're just going to finish with some case studies. 
Uh, and uh, the first case study, uh, those of you who were at the ALA will have seen this before. This was an 84 year old woman who had uh, lymphedema. Oh, that just skipped forward. It's gone into automatic. Not quite sure how that happened, uh, but she had lymphedema and then she fractured her humerus. So she was absolutely not able to um, put on her flat knit garment. I'm not quite sure why this is got a life of its own, but we modified a job skin garment, put a zip in, put some zip tabs. Uh, we actually accommodated this fixed position in uh, uh, elbow flexion uh, by shortening the anterior surface of the garment. And it was something that she could comfortably wear and man we could manage the lymphedema while the humerus uh, repaired itself. Uh, our second case study is a gentleman who sustained a very large burning compression. Just looking at hand. Uh, this is him at about 10 months down the track, actually. Um, again, it's taken on a life of its own, uh, but he had a range of custom garments. But for his, the hypertrophic scarring was extremely um, aggressive. And uh, he, um, I'm sorry, I'm very distracted by the fact that my slides are advancing themselves. He had Cylon Tech slipped, uh, stitched into the Athena uh, component of the uh, glove, which meant that he could have um, silicon on there very easily without trying to uh, manage uh, silicon gel sheets. He didn't need uh, slant inserts because uh, there was no scarring in the web space, so it was perfectly fine to have standard. Our final case study, and I'm, I'm aware of time, was actually a 43-year-old man who had a major um, electrical high voltage injury uh, and uh, needed flat repair plus very extensive um, uh, reconstruction of that upper limb. So the goals for compression for him were scar management for the split skin grafts, shaping of the free flap, but also we wanted to oh, enable hand therapy and uh, for him to return to work. So he ended up in a born to axilla um, uh, and uh, Athena free eminence worked better for him so that for positioning and we had custom placement of the zip. It was a sort of an unusual uh, distribution for uh, where the zip uh, was unusual in that it's not a standard positioning, but that enabled good therapeutic compression over the flap. And I do apologise that they sort of raced their way through, but they for some reason they had a mind of their own. I'm not quite sure how that happened. So just very quickly, prescription and ordering, all the forms that you need can be found on the Jobskin website, www.jobskin.com. Um, and they are the forms that you need for upper limb measuring form. Uh, when you order a garment, you need to put the standard cover sheet or order form, which has got patient details, delivery details, plus the relevant measuring form, upper limb or glove or gauntlet. And they can be emailed to customer service at jobskin.com and they can be contacted uh, during working hours uh, on that number, which is incorrect. It's 03-9915-8000. I apologise, I'm not quite sure how that happened. Uh, and then support that's available to you, I would really encourage you to go to our website. Uh, there's a range of resources under the support and training tab. There's literature, there's uh, lit reviews, there's uh, documents uh, that say the garment options and modification forms. There's uh, brochures that uh, teach you about um, achieving good compression for different clinical purposes. The um, uh, Jobskin offers clinical advice to you. Uh, we have one advisor in New Zealand, that's Veronica, uh, and myself uh, in Australia, so we can be contacted via email or uh, on our mobile phones, and we're really happy to um, visit you when or where possible, which is extremely limited at the moment with uh, coronavirus, um, 
but we're able to do FaceTime, Skype, Microsoft Teams, uh, and that can be with your patient present. And then the design team, I can't speak highly enough about what a wonderful resource they are. They can be emailed at designers at jobskin.com uh, or reached on that number, which I gave you the correct uh, prefix for on this slide. Uh, they are an incredible resource and they do love a good challenge of trying to nut out a solution for complex patients. Just to finish, our upcoming webinars on the 11th of November, again, two sessions available. We're doing the limp crop vest and then in December on the 9th, we're doing garment prescription and design. And next year, our topics include uh, garments for genital edema, an introduction, introduction for compression, that's sort of fairly early on in the year if you've got uh, new therapists in your clinic or hospital. Compression for scar management, using compression in multi-trauma, head and neck lymph lymphedema, um, the lower limb, and we're also going to do a session on compression for lipedema. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you making the time uh, available. Uh, we will be providing you with CPD certificates, um, but we would also welcome your feedback. Uh, we'd be very happy to uh, modify the way we do this, whether the platform we use and also if the information is too fast, too slow, too simple, too complex, please let us know because we do want these to be a good resource for you. Thanks for joining us. Uh, now, any we've got time for some quick questions. We need to start our next uh, session shortly. So um, uh, please uh, unmute yourself and fire away if you have some questions for us. Um, it's just Nicole from Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, just a question about the Cylon text. Um, anyone can help answer this, but um, any sort of issues with allergies, particularly in children? Say, say that again. You just dropped out, Nicole, just near the end then. Any Sorry. what? Are allergies or reactions to the silicon, the Cylon text? Hmm. Uh, I myself haven't seen any reactions to Cylon text. I have, you know, I mean, we all know that you do get reactions to silicons, but I haven't seen any reaction to Cylon text. Veronica, have you? Um, I haven't, and, but I have had some um, feedback from people where um, patients haven't reacted to that, but do usually to sheet silicon because of the adhesive. Yeah. So not you haven't seen any in the Cylon text fabric, only in the sheets? No, no, sorry, that wasn't very clear. Uh, I found that Cylon text is better suited because it doesn't have the adhesive. Oh, gotcha, yeah. Great. I was just thinking it might be a nice option for those who are into the sheet ones, which is great. Yeah. Rose, there's a question come through in the chat from um, Anna, who's just wondering if we're able to provide a link to the slides. Oh, yes. Uh, anyone who is um, has registered for the webinar will be able to access the slides um, uh, after, I think, for a remaining 30 days. The one thing I would say is we can certainly make the document uh, available for you, but we will have to remove uh, patient images. Um, I did mean to say thank you at the start to the patients who were very willingly agreed to their um, uh, images being shown, but we need to make sure that they're not distributed or screenshot in any way. Okay. Um, Rosie um, has jumped on the chat and asked if we can order tapes online. Definitely. There's a section in the website that uh, you can fill in and you can it, you can say, I need one packet of purple, two of, you know, lower limb or whatever. So, yes, definitely. Rosie, I'll pop a link in the chat form to you uh, regarding that. And um, Liz Maynard's just jumped on to say that she likes the Microsoft Teams platform. It's easy to use and um, good to see the comments. Oh, awesome. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz.
Um, Cherie's just asked if the silicon material makes the garment less breathable. She's particularly interested for use in Queen, interested for use in Queensland. That is an excellent question, and yes, it does. So, um, what I would always uh, do when I was supplying someone with a garment with Cylon Tex in is have one garment with and one without. And I usually say to patients that I'm seeing, you can choose when you want to wear it. So, someone who sleeps in air conditioning, they wear their garment with Cylon Tex in it at night. Somebody who works in an air conditioned office, for example, but is kind of more social in the evenings and out and about, may use their one without. So, yeah, it, it definitely does make it less breathable. Okay, I think we might have to love you and leave you because we're just about due to start our second session. Um, thank you so much for being here and we hope you can join us for subsequent webinars. Bye then. <laughs>